good evening, everybody, and a very warm welcome to Bo and to this Just Share event. Uh, my name is Laura Taylor. Um, I'm head of advocacy at Christian Aid, um, which probably most of you know is an international development and relief charity connected to um, the UK church. And we're very excited to be working with Just Share. Um, again, as probably most of you know, and as it says on the sign, Just Share is a coalition of churches and charities who are working to engage the City of London and elsewhere on issues of global and economic justice. Um, and it's a really exciting of events and discussions that Just Share have planned. Um, there are leaflets at the back which give a bit more information about forthcoming events. I'd like to give a particular plug to an event coming up in a couple of months' time um, with Christian Aid, um, looking at tax and morality. Um, but there's lots of other great events coming up as well. Um, so the topic for this evening is what's wrong with poverty? Um, and it's a great pleasure to be able to introduce the Reverend Dr. Sam Wells, who is vicar of St. Martin in the Fields. And I'm sure many of you are here because you've read or heard some of his work before. Um, just as a quick recap, he's done a of things working for 15 years, um, also working as Dean of Duke University Chapel in North um, And Sam is also the visiting professor of Christian ethics at King's College um, and written no less than 20 different books. So I'm very happy to welcome him and to let him speak to you. I'll come back to you for questions at the end, so do think of questions you might like to ask. And there's a time for drinking. Uh, thank you very much for that kind introduction, of the kind invitation to be with you, and thank you to people for turning out uh, tonight. I'm going to take my argument tonight in four stages. I'm going to begin with a general discussion of poverty. I want then to move on to placing poverty in relation to the human condition as a whole. I'm then going to proceed to explore different ways of responding to poverty and disadvantage, and finally, I'm going to seek to make some connections and draw some conclusions. So let's start with poverty and its metaphors. Perceptions of poverty tend to be governed by powerful metaphors. For the sake of simplicity, I'd like to divide those metaphors into two kinds. One kind I shall call metaphors of deficit, and the other I'll call metaphors of dislocation. So starting with metaphors of deficit, let's consider first of all the notion of poverty as desert. The desert metaphor assumes people are poor because they don't have enough. They don't have enough money, food, good relationships, skills, education. This isn't really anyone's fault. It's more a problem of scarcity of resources or poor distribution. The solution is to give people more. In the short term, more money, or in a material economy, more nutritious food and clean water. In the long term, more education, more training in healthy work and family patterns, more stable institutions, more access to credit and outlets for their skills. Another metaphor of de deficit is that of poverty as defeat. Life is a competition, so the argument goes. Some win and some lose. The poor are simply those who lose. They were perhaps dealt a tough hand from bad luck, bad genes, a bad background, or a bad environment. They maybe lived in the wrong century, wrong, wrong country, faced the wrong climate, found themselves in the wrong place at the wrong time. Or some would say they didn't make the most of their opportunities. Everyone it's sometimes maintained has the same chance. It's tough and those with skill and application make it. In this view, tax and welfare increases poverty by taking away incentives for effort while punishing those who succeed. Such a view begs the question, can all succeed? Some take the defeat metaphor so far as to infer that poverty indicates moral failure. For if people had kept their marriages, families, jobs, and local network together, all would be well. A third metaphor of deficit, but this time with less of an odor of judgment, is that of poverty as dragnet. The picture here is of a trap door, like a cat flap. It's easy to fall into, but impossible to get out of. 
In a drag net, fish are pressed so tightly against the net and each other that they can't wriggle free. Jeffrey Sachs, in his book, The End of Poverty, speaks of the inability of very poor countries to reach, to reach the bottom rung of the ladder of economic development. And the trap that closes in when the population is growing faster than capital is being accumulated. Thus, foreign aid has a role in releasing the trap. Turning to metaphors of dislocation, one is that of the dungeon. The dungeon metaphor sees the problem as not about scarcity, but about sin. Poverty is a kind of incarceration. The poor are kept in poverty by a widening circle of exploiters, by the local non-poor, who siphon off resources and benefits that were intended for the disadvantaged, by local authorities who use blackmail and violence to rob the poor, and by local employers and traders who use their strong bargaining position to force the economically vulnerable people to sell their goods and labor below market value. Meanwhile, some see poverty as a prison in which people put themselves, either by passive characteristics such as laziness or lack of ambition, or by more active destructive tendencies such as reckless behavior or substance addiction. A second metaphor of dislocation is that of disease. A disease is a condition with a non-human root cause and physical, mental, social, and spiritual symptoms, which nonetheless requires a very human response in every dimension. This metaphor regards poverty as a kind of sickness. Sickness is usually not something a person is born with, but something they can quickly pick up from those around them. Sickness lies fundamentally in relationships, communities, and societies rather than in individuals. Disease language hints that poverty in some of its dimensions can afflict even the circumstantially rich. Physical change is only part of an ecology of relational, spiritual, and communal dimensions of healing. A third metaphor of dislocation is that of desolation. This picture is less preoccupied with causes and more with symptoms. It perceives geographical, social, and economic isolation. It identifies people who have no relationships in which they can trust and experience the fraying of domestic, extended family and community ties, resulting in vulnerability to the forces of exploitation, the money lender, the protection racketeer, the merciless landlord, the bogus holy man, the drug dealer. In such a situation, it's hard for anyone to identify what has gone wrong, and it's hard for anyone to identify exactly what a willing person could do to help. I've offered six metaphors that grip the imagination of debates about poverty. But what I want to highlight and what I want us to keep in mind is the broad distinction between two kinds of metaphors. On the one hand, there are metaphors of deficit, which see the problem as a lack of resource, of wisdom, application, skill, or education. On the other hand, there are metaphors of dislocation, which see the issues as more about a breakdown in or strain on relationships, health, or community. These two strands name different anthropologies, different notions of aid and development, different notions of sin and redemption, and thus different understandings of public policy and the church's mission. Now, I want to put this question of poverty on an even wider canvas. Let's identify one of the biggest questions of all. What's the essential problem of human existence? I want not just to name the answer most educated people in the West would most probably give to the question, but to explore it in such a way that we can see how that answer shapes our understanding of and response to poverty. Here's my hypothesis. Our culture's operational assumption has long been that the central problem of human existence is mortality. From the moment we come into the world, our fundamental crisis is that we're going to die. Given that eternity is rather extensive by anyone's measure, any limited lifespan that falls short of eternity is bound to be unsatisfactory. And three score years and ten are not inherently less adequate than a million or two. But the issue isn't simply that life is limited in terms of duration. Human flourishing is circumscribed by a host of other limitations. If we simply invoke nine, we might note disability, 
chronic ill health and terminal illness, poverty, hardship, and malnutrition, adverse weather, famine, and limited natural resources. It's a formidable list. We're hemmed in on all sides, not just by death, but by a host of other constraints. What's changed in perhaps the last 50 or 60 years is that at least in the West, humanity no longer feels such limitations are integral to its existence. There was a time when death and taxes named the unshiftable givens of human experience and that life was a largely stoic matter of learning to live within the boundaries of limited human potential. Death took place in the home, most illnesses had little or no chance of a cure, and it was best to prepare oneself for a fragile existence or face hubristic disappointment or humiliation. The world's resources may have held enormous potential, but the technology and techniques for tapping that potential were still in their infancy. But those days have gone. A cascade of technological advance in fields such as medicine, transport, and information transfer has made such constraints seem absurd rather than necessary. The human project is no longer about coming to terms with limitations and flourishing within them. It's now, almost without question, about overcoming and transcending limitations. Human contingency is not something we learn to live with. It's something we expect to conquer. Doing so is part of our self-assertion, our full expression, our spreading of our wings. It's more or less become the defining project of the human race. It seems all are agreed that the key project of our species is the alleviation, overcoming, and transcendence of mortality. We achieve this by inventing medicines, discovering new dimensions of experience, reducing or reversing limitations such as blindness, breaking athletic records, and circumventing such tragedies as famine or muscular dystrophy. That's what we strive for. That's what gains outstanding individuals' rewards and acclaim. That's what our culture prizes most highly. Our society celebrates nothing more than the overcoming of limitation in sport, in science, in communications, in health. Every invention, every new world record, every new gadget is a sacrament of the deepest human desire of our age, to become free by transcending limitation, and thus for a moment believing we can withstand even death. The para recent Paralympics enriched the human project because for many people they redefined sport. No longer is sport just about excellence and making sacrifices and being better than others. Now sport is primarily a celebration of overcoming obstacles and adversity and thus opening a door to independence and freedom. In other words, sport ceased, ceased to be an enjoyable diversion from the central human quest, the central quest of humankind, and become instead the definitive embodiment of that central human project. In the Middle Ages, the most celebrated cultural moments were the discovery of precious documents from the classical period. Each one represented a reclaiming of a piece of and an avenue into a lost golden era. Today, the golden moments are the transcending of another dimension of human limitation. When we advertise our organizations, we seldom still say making lead pencils the same way for 150 years. Instead, we say testing and stretching the boundaries of knowledge, making the impossible possible. The single notion that sums up this sense of throwing off limitations is freedom. And the term we employ to commodify freedom and give it retail value is choice. So the basic line in promoting what we do is to say our product or service overcomes one or more of the real or perceived constraints of our daily or lifelong existence and thus gives us more choice. Now the six metaphors of poverty that we've just explored are significant because they all presuppose a view on the fundamental problem of human existence. Each of the first three metaphors largely assumes that the fundamental human problem is mortality and thus directs the great majority of our endeavor towards creating opportunities for people to overcome the world's limitations and their own. 
I'm suggesting that educated people in our culture generally assume the fundamental human problem is mortality specifically and human limitation more generally. That judgment indicates a particular understanding of what's wrong with poverty. Poverty is taken to be an extreme case of the limitations inherent in the human condition, an extreme constraint of freedom. But here's my central point. What if it turned out that the fundamental human problem wasn't mortality after all? What if it turned out that poverty wasn't basically about limitation? What if it turned out that all along the fundamental human problem and the central factor in poverty was isolation? What do I mean by this? If the fundamental human problem is isolation, then the solutions we're looking for don't lie in the laboratory or the hospital or the frontiers of human knowledge or experience. Instead, the solutions lie in the things we already have, most of all in one another. Let me explain this by asking a basic theological question. Why do Christians, to use conventional and familiar language, want people to be saved? An obvious answer might be because those people are going to die and maybe they'll go to hell or oblivion or nothingness or whatever the latest term for downstairs happens to be. But if you say, and what's so great about going to heaven then, what kind of an answer do you get? Heaven is the state of being with God and being with one another and being with the renewed creation. That's to say, heaven isn't simply a matter of continued being. What matters is that that continued being is being with. In other words, a heaven that's simply and only about overcoming mortality is an eternal life that's not worth having. It's not worth having because it leaves one alone forever. And being alone forever isn't a description of heaven, it's a description of hell. There's no value in being unless it's being with. There's no value in existence unless it's existence with, in, with relationship, with God, with one another, and the creation. The heaven that's worth aspiring to is a rejoining of such relationship, a restoration of community, a discovery of partnership, a sense of being in the presence of another in which there's neither a folding of identities that loses their difference nor a sharpening of difference that leads to hostility but an enjoyment of the other that evokes cherishing and relishing. The theological word for this is communion. Have another look at the second set of metaphors of poverty, the ones I called metaphors of dislocation. Here we find dungeon, disease, and desolation. These are all fundamentally about the breakdown of relationships. They're not about limitation and mortality. They're about underusing and misusing the gift of one another. They don't presuppose scarcity, competition, and conflict. They open the imagination to limitless possibility and restored connection. On to part three. I want you to hold on to that distinction between mortality and isolation because I'm going to return to it in a moment. But first, I want to explore what I'm calling four models of engagement with poverty. It'll become apparent that there's a close relationship between the portrayal of these four models and the distinction between isolation and mortality. But first, let me set out the four models by way of a simple illustration from my daily experience. Imagine you're walking through Trafalgar Square, and you see a homeless person. I'm assuming you care about the well-being of all God's children and you have a sense that homelessness is a particular kind of distress that brings together a cluster of hardship in the past, powerlessness in the present, and poor prospects for the future that almost epitomizes poverty. I want to suggest you have four options. The first is to say, we need to get people off the streets into housing, employment, and profitable use of time. You may be energized to join the board of a night shelter or a day center assisting homeless people. You may be more direct and immediate and bring the homeless person in question a drink or a sandwich or an item of clothing or a leaflet advertising various services. You may even be motivated to advocate for this person and many people in similar circumstances. 
lobbying your councillor or MP or bringing together a meeting to address homelessness in central London. The second option is to speak to the homeless person, to explore with them the reasons why they're homeless, to ensure they know what options are available for them, the local drug and alcohol rehabilitation schemes, the places where free health care is available, the drop-in centers where there's training and career advice, the sites where there are art and singing and football groups to help build confidence and make connections. Maybe you could offer to take them to, to these places now or later. The third option is simply to sit down beside the homeless person and pass the time of day with them. Share first names, talk about where they're from, ask what it's like to spend a day or a night outside. Wonder what they think of people like yourself scurrying by, inquire if they feel frightened or lonely, drink a cup of coffee with them, discuss the latest developments in politics or the Premier League, and gradually locate the questions they really want to ask and the wisdom they deeply have to share. The fourth option is to feel rising anger about the fact there are so many homeless people in central London and to denounce this situation on your blog site, to get very exercised about the use of the dehumanizing term the homeless instead of the more respectful homeless people, to give money to appeals for organizations that work with homeless issues, and to ensure that no one makes any stereotypical assumptions about mental health or a history of being abused or substance addiction or a history of incarceration when they meet a homeless person. I call the first option working for, because when you go on boards and lobby MPs, you're working for the homeless person. And the second approach is working with, because it's got all the energy of the first option, but this time you're actually engaging the homeless person in their own redemption, rather than deciding for them. The third approach, where you simply sit beside the homeless person for a coffee and a chat, is being with. And the fourth option is being for, because you don't actually encounter the homeless person at all, but you orient your life towards their well-being as you perceive it. You can imagine these four models, working for, working with, being with, and being for, as four corners of an old-fashioned square window pane. I want to point out a number of things about these four models. Working for is the default setting for most engagements with poverty. The homeless person is regarded as a problem and as a symptom of a deeper problem. The working for approach seeks to fix that problem with the range of resources the professional person has to hand. To the one with a hammer in their pocket, everything looks like a nail. The professional person sees the problems the professional person's skills are equipped to solve. The key word in this whole approach is solution. The world is full of problems and professional people are those who can provide solutions. The main issue is how to maximize efficiency and match solutions to problems most effectively. Being for is somewhat similar except it tends to assume the problem is someone else's to address. In this model, the word being suggests the orientation of a life, but an orientation that expects others who hold the power to pull the levers and make the changes and release the funds and implement the strategies. Being for adopts a posture rather more in solidarity with the homeless person, or at least homelessness in general, but note the feature working for and being for have in common, that's to say the little word for. Neither working for nor being for require you to have any significant kind of conversation or interaction with any homeless person at all. The idea that the homeless person may have a role in their own redemption doesn't seriously figure. There's an abiding possibility that the idea of the homeless person or some value or symbolic societal deficiency that homeless represents figures rather larger than the reality of homelessness itself. The result is that working for and being for generate a host of solutions, but they're solutions that tend to get little or no take up from the people they're designed to help. Why are people so ungrateful? Most likely because if every interaction in your life is one in which you are the client and source of distress, while the other person is the benefactor and source of salvation, 
you're not going to be looking for extra encounters that reinforce such humiliation. The sense of being a problem solver is electric. The, pro the sense of being perpetually a problem to be solved is diminishing. Consider by contrast the other two models working with and being with. These both presuppose genuine, serious, and sustained interaction with the homeless person. Such interaction can be demanding, time-consuming, and significantly lacking in adrenaline. The word with indicates a fundamental difference from the philosophy of for. Both of the with models take for granted that the homeless person must be at the heart of whatever takes place, that there can be no transformation without agency. Working with gathers a whole range of stakeholders and sees the homeless person as having a crucial contribution alongside service providers and concerned organizations. It's a much more dynamic model than working for and sensitive to a much wider range of contributions than simply professional expertise. Where working with differs from being with is that working with still sees a problem, albeit one that's shared by a range of different people and bodies. If you think of community organizing, the whole dynamic is to focus on a problem, isolate it, polarize in relation to it, and then bring together a short-term coalition of stakeholders to address and resolve it. The whole process depends on the energy released and momentum gained by problem solving. It's still captivated by the notion of the solution. The homeless person themselves is no longer seen as the problem, becoming more of a fellow stakeholder in a range of social issues, but what hasn't changed is the assumption that life is a series of problems awaiting solutions. Being with, by contrast, doesn't start with a problem. Or if it does, the problem lies with you scurrying through Trafalgar Square rather than with the homeless person. You don't sit and have a coffee with a homeless person because you're trying to solve their problem. You do so because you want to receive the wealth of wisdom humanity and grace that God has to give you through them. You aren't the source of their salvation. They are the source of yours. If you talk about problems, you make sure you're attending to the ones they name and identify rather than the ones you perceive or imagine. But more likely, you don't start with the scarcity of the problem, but with the abundance of the wonder of life, even perhaps especially a homeless life. You aren't seeing what this person isn't, and you aren't focusing on what they haven't got. You're seeing the mystery of what they are and celebrating the joy of what they have. You aren't trying to fix them. You're, you're seeking to receive the gift of their life and the blessing they have to share with you. Your every effort is to enjoy their being and share your own rather than change their reality through assuming a script you've imposed from elsewhere. What I've done so far is to look at poverty, set the issues of poverty within the deeper question of the human condition, and then to begin to draw connections between the question of the human condition and the models of engaging poverty. Now I want to identify some key theological themes that might shape our judgments on these matters. Does God see the world as a problem to be solved or a gift to be enjoyed? On looking at the world, does God see deficit or dislocation? Does Christ become incarnate because there's a job of redemption to be done and only he can do it, or because the whole point of creation was that God would dwell with us terrestrially in Jesus and eternally in heaven? Does Christ hang on the cross in order to fix the problem of human mortality or to overcome the barriers that create isolation? How do we seek an answer to such questions? I suggest the place to look for such an answer is in the shape of Jesus' life. The incarnation presupposes that it was not enough for God simply to be for us. God is always for us, but that's an inadequate way of understanding God's purpose in making us and the world. God's purpose is to be with us. That's what the prologue to John's Gospel announces and the epilogue to Matthew's Gospel confirms. God dwells among us, full of grace and truth, and will be with us always to the end of time. 
That's what the cross demonstrates in all its agony and awesome sacrifice. Christ is with us even if the cry of dereliction suggests the cost of his being with us, at least momentarily, is his not being with the Father. For a week in Jerusalem, for moments in Galilee that we call miracles, in teaching and in challenging religious authority, Jesus was working for us. There's a difference between creator and creatures. There are some things, most obviously creation, resurrection, and inaugurating and fulfilling the kingdom, that only God can do. But the Gospels don't show us a God who in Christ is merely for us. They show us a Christ who is fundamentally with us. Jesus works with the disciples in Galilee. He shows them, employs them, trains them, empowers them, sends them, chastises them. However frail and foolish they turn out to be, there's no question of him going to Jerusalem on his own. We're so familiar with the notion of Jesus teaching the disciples, we seldom reflect that if delivering us from our sins was all Jesus came to do, calling disciples was superfluous. There's a job for the disciples to do, but that job is distinctly collaborative. It is, by definition, working with Jesus. But the ministerial period of calling, training, and sending disciples, the working with part, and the atoning process of passion, death, and resurrection, the working for part, together only make up perhaps 10% of Jesus' life among us. What is the theological significance of the hidden 90%? the 30-odd years Jesus spent in Nazareth. Surely those Nazareth years demonstrate in their obscurity as much as their sheer duration God's fundamental purpose to be with us, not primarily to rescue us or even empower us, but simply be with us, to share our existence, to enjoy our hopes and fears, our delights and griefs, our triumphs and disasters. This is the way incarnation echoes creation and anticipates heaven. Jesus simply relishes life with us and bewilders and disarms us with his patience, his gentleness, his presence, and his attention. All the other actions of God in being for us, working with us, and working for us are ways of preparing and redeeming the ground for the fundamental purpose of creation, salvation, and final redemption, God being with us. Let's reflect on Christian efforts at addressing poverty in the light of this exploration of God's engagement with us. It's easy for Christians to default to the working for model. Christians fear quietism and cynicism and passive disengagement, associating it with the priest and the Levite who walked by on the other side. And meanwhile, they want to believe in solutions. They want to think problems can be fixed. They celebrate the great social reformers and philanthropists who righted the wrongs of the early industrial era. So Christians like the idea of working for, particularly when it highlights and harnesses their own particular skills. And working for is usually a good deal better than being for. Being for may vote, being for may write editorials, being for may donate money, being for may compile research, but being for, while assuming something must be done, generally assumes it's for someone else actually to do the doing. Working for at least assumes we ourselves must be part of the doing. But in working for, we seldom know the homeless person by name and almost never regard them as our teacher. And to that degree, working for is a model that ensures the homeless person remains a stranger to us. Thus, at best, it can only be a means to an end. As for working with, it's closer to God's ways with the world. There's a great deal to be said for making partnerships with a range of stakeholders and inspiring the agency of the homeless person themselves to work on a project together. This surely is an image of the kingdom where needy and powerful expert and volunteer, faithful member of another faith and unbeliever can discover solutions and uncover deeper layers of obstruction together. This is Galilee. In particular, in the British post-war context, it's an energizing break away from the assumption that all approaches are rooted in government policy and welfare provision. Poverty becomes a disease to be healed rather than a mechanism to be recalibrated, and all hands are needed to assault the disease. Working with offers more than a glimpse of God's purposes for us and a profound analogy for the dynamics of church. 
but it still presupposes an adversarial contest of defeating and overcoming. It still speaks the language of problem and solution, and it still assumes an occasionalistic picking off of challenges one by one. The goal of Christian social engagement must surely be being with. The Christian faith is that God originally made and endlessly reiterated a decision never to be except to be with us. And embodying that faith means constantly looking for ways to be with God, with one another, and with the creation. The goal of working for and working with isn't independent, freestanding individuals released from all setbacks and problems and challenges, but an interactive and permeable community of interdependent beings who discover gifts where others might only see needs and unearth treasure where others might only see trouble. Just as at the center of the church's common life is worship, the simple being with God for no purpose than the glory and goodness of being so, so at the center of the church's mission should be being with the stranger, with the expectation of meeting and learning from and wondering at and enjoying the Christ made known in them. So to conclude. One can tell the story of modernity as the tussle between two key principles, liberty and equality. They broadly name the two major party political options, at least in a British context, but when one returns to the motto of the French Revolution as adopted by the Third Republic, fraternity may appear to be the neglected one of the three. Of course, each term has many definitions and fraternity is too masculine a term to be fit for wholehearted commendation. But the general point stands that liberty and equality are noble aims, but finally only a means to an end. And it's fraternity that should be regarded as the proper goal of its two more celebrated predecessors. The distinction between metaphors of deficit and metaphors of dislocation, the identification of mortality as an alternative to isolation, and the four models of engaging disadvantage together yield an irony that I've been trying to highlight. And that irony is this. Those initiatives that generally begin with a deficit notion of poverty and assume the human predicament is mortality and limitation and most often adopt a working for model of engagement with social disadvantage have a tendency of actually increasing isolation. The isolation concern recognizes that in all the haste to provide technology and enhance technique, and alleviate the limitations of climate or scarcity or skill, mortality-motivated interventions can often underline and even enhance the kinds of social alienation that, from the isolation perspective, constitute the problem in the first place. What, therefore, is wrong with poverty? In the understanding I'm following, poverty isn't fundamentally about the absence of money or about the lack of conventional forms of power. It's about the impoverishment, the instrumentalization, the manipulation, the breakdown, or the perversion of relationship. For sure, poverty diminishes human dignity, and human dignity is often taken to be a fundamental matter whose upholding needs no advocacy. But notice again that the quest to assert and affirm human dignity may have the unanticipated side effect or the less explicit implication of leaving people alone and reinforcing their isolation. There's something more fundamental than detached dignity, and that's the enrichment of genuine and enhancing relationships. Working for is a form of technology that seeks to make a better world without us needing to become better people. A kind of device that seeks to rescue people without the bothersome business of relationships. All that working for initiatives can do is to facilitate circumstances and conditions in which crucial relationships can begin, take root, grow, and thrive. Such initiatives can address mortality and limitation, but they can't overcome isolation. That's as clear a lesson for public policy as it is for theology. Being with is easily decried as too facile, too flimsy, too fanciful a notion to play any significant role in social ethics or public policy. What use such fluff, one might be asked, when people are going without food in order to be able to give supper to their children or going cold at night for lack of benefits? The question in return is, 
what is the goal of public policy or the vision of social ethics? My argument is that what both are or should be oriented towards is contained in the word with. And all this, the activity of working for and the angst of being for are simply preliminaries to the true nature of flourishing life and the opposite of poverty, which lies in working and ultimately being with. Thank you very much. Um, I wonder if you would like to stay at the microphone. and uh, We've got some time for questions now. Um, I've got a couple up my sleeve if we need to get the things going, but realizing we've not got much time. Has anyone got a question they would like to, to begin with? There's one at the front. There's a microphone coming for you. So. Uh, you've left me feeling very guilty um, because I'm on the committee of a rent deposit scheme, a homelessness prevention project um, and we have just I'm, I'm on the committee I don't work directly with the clients um, but I think our member of staff does do so very sensitively but we've just received um, additional funding from the county to try and get people off the streets there's not too many people on the streets in Surrey in quite the way there are around St Martin's in the fields but uh, I've taken posters to all the churches in the area it's not a specifically christian based thing but i've taken posters to all the churches in the area which say do you s notice anybody sleeping rough then give us our details s tell them about us encourage them to come um, and we need more funding all the time for <laughs> to keep going at all but i'm thinking are we doing the right thing is there another way or is there just are you just saying we need to do more as individuals. Um, so can I go away feeling, shall I go away feeling guilty or? <laughs> um, I think if one attends an event about poverty and one isn't oneself in that social location in conventional economic terms, one is almost always going to go away feeling guilty. I think that's a given. So I, 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 um, I don't take responsibility for that. Um, but in terms of a, a, a wider, I, th I think we, we, we like to construct, when I say we, I mean, uh, I mean people who care and want to help. Uh, we like to construct a world in which uh, working for can provide solutions. I mean, I, I hope I narrated that fairly adequately. Uh, I certainly tried to. Um, However, it, it doesn't work. Uh, it does work sometimes. Um, you know, if you, if, if you go, if, if I go to my dentist, well, I've got a thing to say in light of recent events, but we won't go into the personal side of that. If I go to my dentist and my dentist fixes a tooth for me, that's, a, that's an ideal transaction of a working for variety. The dentist has skills, so on. I am not constantly humiliated in every interaction of my life by being on the receiving end of how bad my teeth are, how bad my, you know, other forms of investment in life are. This is a, this is a one thing in the day and the rest of the time I go back to being busy and important and so it's fine. Um, and as I said, you know, that's, that, 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 but that dynamic isn't the case with most working for interactions. Uh, and wouldn't it, be an, wouldn't it be a simple world if, I mean, you know, my enemy in a sense is this word fix. But actually, you know, one of the things that I do each year is the Radio 4 St. Martin of the Fields Christmas Appeal. I get three minutes or two and a half minutes or whatever it is, 445 words, basically, of which a lot has to be repeating the address and everything. So, you know, about 350 words to convey a message that makes people feel good about giving money to, and, and, and the danger is always that I'm, I've got, I've, you know, I've got my integrity on the line, really, about whether I believe what I'm saying. I, I believe in creating situations where relationships can bring about healing. Uh, what you're describing, or to take another much talked about contemporary example, a food bank, uh, you know, these are two working for examples. And 
the weaknesses in them, I think I've pointed out, the strengths in them are that working for can do a lot of good. I mean, don't get me wrong. I, I say what I say in the way that I say it because I feel not enough people are saying this. We live in a very working for world. I possibly exaggerate my argument because I, I, I'm hoping to get some attention for this stuff. Um, because I do feel it's fundamentally true. But, uh, but the food bank or what, you, what you're describing, the scheme you're describing, can get people into this. And then once you're in this, once you're in the food bank, for example, yes, you do end up having a conversation with the person that comes to the food bank. And in my view, that conversation is probably far more important than the food. But if there wasn't a food bank, you'd never have that conversation. And I, I would take that as an analogy for the kind of work you're doing. You've got to start somewhere. And you know, as the example I gave of the Traval Trafalgar Square is I'm assuming you're a person who cares about these issues. Well, within that, <laughs> I mean, a lot of what your work is, get, is empowering people to feel they can do something. And if what I do disempowers people by thinking there's no point in me doing any working for at all, then you know, it hasn't been a, a complete success. It's been a failure, really. Uh, I want to empower people, but I'm, I was assuming tonight I was talking to people who were already in that conversation. So I was trying to nudge people along towards, you know, what is this really all about? Fantastic. Um, let's take some other questions. Maybe a couple. There's one from this lady there. Any other questions? Um, and one at the back as well. Uh, it's maybe less questioning, suggestion. Working with, would it have something to do with scale? that you can address, you know, because um, sorry, being with versus working, uh, working for, sorry. Um, being with, it's one-to-one, -one, so you address one person. <laughs> working for, potentially, you get the scale and you can scale. address yeah. thousands of people. And maybe we need the two together, but the being with might not be sufficient. Maybe if we take a question at the back and then you can answer both of them. No, I, I really like your um, emphasis upon being with and with um, the idea or the reality of relationship as being at the heart of the matter, um, both from a Christian or theological point of view um, and also from a, um, if you like, from an economic point of view, because we really seem to be in a world of either or, and that's the real problem. So you're either for us or against us. We keep setting up these... Uh, sort of binary situations um, and um, which is convenient for, for some people and can also make some people feel better about what they're temporarily doing but the real challenge is to see the interconnectedness of everything so that um, whatever we might be doing for um, say the poor in the world I'm not sure how much is understood about how what our whole system is still doing to those poor and keeping them poor, yeah. exacerbating the uh, gulf between um, people with and people without, which has been getting massively greater uh, as we've applied this um, system. So I like the idea of relationship, sure. which is not to the either the um, we're, we're all in it together soundbite, but a real sense of understanding the that deep interconnectedness of and responsibility with that. Yeah, okay, let's take those two. two. I mean, I, I, I'm, I think th there is an element of scale there, but, but to me the more important distinction than scale is urgency. So clearly, you know, if you find yourself in a, in a, in a disaster relief context, such as this country where you know, something, uh, the earthquake, shall we t t to take that as probably the least politically charged, even though that often is politically charged, but, uh, you know, most of the aftermath of war kind of things get very politically charged in the kind of the ways that you're, you're asking the second question. But if we take the earthquake, well, yeah, I mean, the ultimate working for is to drop supplies from a helicopter or a plane. I mean, that's about as working for as you can possibly get. It's a kind of caricature, but of course we do it. Um, and there's a place for that, you know, in terms of urgency. In the first two or three days, what else can you do? Um, so I, I'd, I'd see it more in terms of urgency than in terms of scale, because uh, 
and the reason I'd make the distinction, uh, you know, I, I'd back off from scale, is to say uh, the, and I, I, I'm wary of saying this because I'm, you know, I'm wary of overstating my argument and, and, and sounding kind of almost heartless, <laughs> but which is of course the opposite of what I want to sound. Um, but I just want to put the idea in your mind that in that notion of scale, there's a kind of greed. There's a kind of greed that says, oh, I can fix 10 million people's problems with the same amount of effort it would take to sit in a hospice beside a person who's almost to the vegetative state stage who needs all my attention you know, for the next 10 years. Do you see what I mean? And, and I can do a whole country here. I can do East Africa just like that. And, and there's a kind of greed in that which actually loses... You know, the, the astonish I mean, theologically, the astonishing thing that Christian theology supposes that God was wholly revealed in one person. Whereas you'd think it would be much more efficient if God was wholly revealed in millions of people. You know, nobody could miss out. Or, you know, you think of the scale. Fantastic economy of scale by God there. Well done, God. But God's stupid God just did it through the one. Now, of course, we know better than that. We do scale. We upscale, you know, we do economies of scale. You see what I'm saying? There's a kind of non-theological greed there. I just wanted to point that out. I don't want to say there's nothing about doing big programs. They're always right. I don't want to exaggerate in that sense, but I just want to put the idea in your mind. Uh, so as far as the second one, as the second point is concerned, uh, it's difficult to respond to because, you, you know, the response that says it's about everything is, is, uh, is, a, is a hard one to respond to almost inevitably, especially when you made an argument when you're saying it's really about one of those things. Um, so I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to say a great deal about that other than to say clearly, you know, with the, with the old tap analogy, when there's a leak in the tap, sometimes you've got to go up to the supply point and you've got to, you know, you've got to be working out who's creating the problem upstream and and the conversation about structural injustice and systemic uh, forms of economic injustice, you know, is, is, is about, it, it you know, goes back to that tap analogy. Um, I, I, I would just again, though I, I accept, I accept that, but again, speaking to this audience of, I think, you know, almost without exception, well-educated, well-informed, well-engaged people, um, the, the, the temptation to, to withdraw from the personal encounter in order somehow to, to get right, whether that's to write the editorial or to, you know, or to, to produce the report, is, is very, very strong. And again, it, it, it influences, you know, when, we can, when we say it, it, it affects structural change and these kind of things. So why did God not do it that way? You know, that's what I'm trying to wrestle with and say that, that actually if we follow Jesus' ministry, it was made up of, of these personal encounters. And clearly, there are, you know, there are changes in the way society works and the internet and all sorts of things that, that weren't around in the first century. But that fundamental percentage orientation of 1% in Jerusalem, 9% in Galilee, and 90% in Nazareth, that's the biggest thing I want to leave with you. And the challenge of that, nine, that useless 90% in Nazareth as being, you know, the, our starting point, our, our, our default setting for our engagement with poverty is that 90%, that useless 90% of just being with people because they are great to be with, not because we've got a whole head full of what their problems are and the indicators. And I mean... It, it, if you're familiar with ABCD, Asset-Based Community Development, John McKnight, you're, you'll, you'll, you'll have come across a sort of secular version of, of the argument that I'm making. It makes more or less the same kind of points without the theology. Um, I might just take the chair's prerogative and ask a follow-up question on that, yeah. if I may, and then I'll come to you. Um, it's just obviously um, coming from the international development sector, um, I, th I, mean, I think the challenge is right that our focus might be on working for, or perhaps working with, um, rather than being with, but I wonder how that, that concept of communion fits with the concept and the biblical concept of justice. Um, and 
holding those two things in tension. Like you say, if you can see by being with someone that there are structures that are preventing equality in your communion because of the different hindrances there, surely part of our Christian calling is also to tackle some of those structures and to fight for God's justice in that yeah, situation. I mean, so don't get me wrong. I give to Christian aid. <laughs> you know, I personally give to Christian aid. It is, oh, I believe in the work you do. <laughs> um, it, uh, I, I'm not suggesting that we, we don't need that kind of advocacy, we don't need that kind of work. I'm just saying that if we balance the boat entirely onto that, yeah. you know, I'm not saying that Christian aid, uh, I appreciate the, the moves that are being made towards working with, and I applaud those, you know, that's clearly the, <laughs> I'm clearly on that side of the argument. Um, however, you know, Christian aid can only do what Christian aid can do. It's, it's an aid agency. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> don't expect it to be, but don't expect it, don't subcontract our conscience to Christian aid to take it off our desk. That's what I'm saying. So I'm not complaining about you guys. No, no. I'm complaining <laughs> about us guys who assume that you do our conscience work for us. That doesn't leave us with, just as the welfare state in this country doesn't leave Christians with a clean desk, we've got to make the relationships and the welfare state picks up you know, the extreme cases. Um, so, so, okay, I mean, how long have I got? Um, we kind of, uh, there's one more question yeah. from this lady, and I think okay. we probably need to wrap up. Is that all right? It's a, huge, to... well, it's yeah. a huge question. <laughs> so I could give you a whole other lecture on it, but just very, very briefly. If you think about the letter to Philemon, Paul's letter to Philemon, you know, it's about a runaway slave, and Paul is writing to the owner of that runaway slave, saying, uh, receive that runaway slave back as a friend, no longer as a slave. Now, there's three, there's three ways... Uh, that, that, that Paul talks about this. The first way we could call conventional justice, in other words, justice for the winners, uh, where the, the, you know, the rich write the rules, if you like, the kind of justice that I might, you know, Christian aid is opposing, if you like. Uh, well, in that case, if Paul was writing out of that script, he would send Onesimus back, but he would be a slave again because he would be keeping the local rules. Then there's the second kind of... Uh, justice, which is justice for the losers, which is about rights and about the kind of language I think you're talking about and referring to. Now, yes, that's good because in that version, Onesimus remains a free man, and that's got to be good news. However, the lang that kind of language and the kind of way that that justice work is conventionally done leaves Onesimus and Philemon at best strangers to one another and quite possibly enemies. What Paul is talking about in terms of Anis uh, uh, Philemon receiving Onesimus back as a, uh, as, a, as a fellow worker in Christ, rather than as a stranger, an enemy, or a slave again, is something beyond justice. You know, that, and the word we have for something that's beyond justice is church. So, yes, I think there's a real problem with conventional justice justice for the winners, where people buy, you know, basically buy justice. I think that's, I'm with you on that. I get, I, I think, I think I'd like to say, and I th I'd like to say my, you know, CV suggests that I get the second kind of justice, and I've worked for that. However, I'm not prepared to stop there, and I don't think the church should be prepared to stop there. I do think when you're in the public sphere, as you are, that's, po po number two is probably about as much as you can communicate, but that's why I imagine the reason why you've come to this event is because you're not happy with number two. <laughs> Otherwise, you wouldn't be in a church. <laughs> By coming to a church, you're saying one and two can't be the only options. Otherwise, I'd, you know, the one and two are all out there. You know, they're, they're, they're there for us. We come to a church because we want number three. Now, we're not always very good at, uh, at um, articulating and living number three. We are often lapse into a ghastly form of one. And when we all have to put our hand on our heart about that, and we back the wrong side, you know, I was in Norfolk for six years, and in Norfolk no one goes to church because the church backed the wrong side of these debates, are back number one since 1381 in the President's Revolt, and it's, it still does at some times. Um, so we've, we've got a, you know, we've got a dodgy history on that, but, I, but my whole life, if you like, is oriented to try to foster communities of number three. Thank you. Um, Let's have one final question. Really, very briefly, thank you for giving me so much to reflect upon, especially as last week I was at Milago Hospital in Kampala with a teaching project of which I am a trustee. I, we go out twice a year and we have a good track record and we've been there constantly for nine years. Therefore, we are not just people who come in and then disappear and never to return. 
I'm quite sure as trustees we think we are working with. I'm not convinced that we are not seen as those working for. Seen by the local people. Yeah. Yeah. I haven't got much to say to that other than to say you've put your finger on something really important. Um, and and in the, if I were a trustee and I was at a trustee meeting, that would be number one item on my agenda is, is, is how do we bring out the with? How do we, how do we make sure that the education we are facilitating, I wouldn't want to use the word providing, that the education we're facilitating is um, developing these people's gifts, not implanting in them our knowledge. You know, are people experiencing the permission giving and the springing up of living water inside their souls, or are they be given, being given techniques and information and knowledge? And, you know, that would be my number one item on the agenda, because it seems to me if you're going to, you know, the fundamental being with thing, as I talk, try to give with a simple analogy of the cup of coffee in the Premier League discussion in Trafalgar Square, is I am with you because of the sheer joy and the revelation of God that comes to me through you. Not because I feel guilty about your poverty, not because I've got all these skills and I feel so privileged and I've got to give them to you, not because I get a kick out of teaching and you're happy to be taught, whereas people in the East End of London seem to want to be taught by, by me. You know, not, none of these reasons. It's because of the sheer joy of, where, you know, in other words, I know you by your first name and I regard you as my teacher. And if you can say that, then you're doing all you can, seems to me. <laughs> doesn't mean you're always going to feel good about it or everyone's going to like you, but that, that's what you're aiming for. But I appreciate your honesty and I appreciate the work you do because nine years, you can't argue with that. That's, there's a lot of width in that. Fantastic. I think we probably now need to draw the conversation to a close, but there will be time for um, further conversations and reflections at the back, so please do stay for that. And let's just thank Sam again for such great food for thought and a really interesting contribution. Thank you very much. <laughs>